All right, guys, so we need to talk more about terminology of the polarimeter uh, and maybe give you an equation to do before we lead up to the analysis part and the graphical part of this first part of the lab. Uh, and uh, that's the difference between an observed rotation and a specific rotation. So there's two of these that are in the laboratory, and the reason is because specific rotation is meant under very specific conditions. Uh, so there's got to be a way that we can relate everything and compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges, right? So let's say that an analyst goes into a laboratory and they make a dilution of a sample and run it. Or let's say that their polarimeter tube is a little bit longer uh, and um, they run that sample. Or the polarimeter tube is much shorter and they run that sample. Or let's say that the concentration of the sample itself is very, very weak. Or what if the concentration is very, very strong? All of these variables are out there. And it's perfectly okay to mix all of those up. The issue, though, is that we have to have a way that we can relate everyone's measurements together. We have to have something that's consistent that we can always go to in a table form and say, yes, this number matches mine. All right. So if I dissolved a sugar in a laboratory and let's say that my sugar is more concentrated than the lab next door, I would get a different number as far as the rotation because they use the weaker sample, which is less amount of molecule. I've used a stronger sample, which is more amount of molecule. And the molecules are what rotates the light. So they'll rotate light and we'll both have different answers. So the specific rotation is what is found in a reference book. And these are under very specific conditions. Okay? The observed rotation, this is what a person actually measures in a laboratory. So you're going to be obtaining observed rotation, not specific rotation. And we're going to have to relate these two together. How does the observed rotation relate to a specific rotation? And there's an equation that we use in order to do this. So this is what the equation looks like. Uh, a lot of times they'll start with a bracket. Let's see if I can move this back up. All right. So a lot of times they'll start with a bracket and they'll put the little alpha on the inside and they'll close the bracket up and they'll put a big T up here and a little lambda down here. And that's equal to an alpha, which is not in a bracket, divided by L times C. So that's the equation that you will have to use in this laboratory, all right? You're going to be obtaining observed rotation, and the observed rotation is going to be alpha. So that's the number that's going to be plugged into this equation. The specific rotation is the alpha in the brackets because the bracket is representing under certain conditions, and these are the criteria in order to get this number. So specific, specific rotation is going to be listed here. The T is for temperature. Uh, a lot of times the Merck or the CRC or a reference book is going to give you specific rotations in terms of temperature. And the lambda is the wavelength down here at the bottom. And typically we're always using sodium D. Uh, because these two things typically stay consistent, we never really write them even though that we should, uh, and we just draw bracket A equals A over L times C, okay? Uh, the L, what does the L mean? This is the length of the polarimeter tube, and the length of the polarimeter tube is going to be given in terms of decimeter. Uh, typically, specific rotation is in terms of one decimeter tubes, uh, but they know that not everyone uses a one decimeter tube. We don't, so that means if we did our measurements, we use a half of a decimeter. So 0.5 is the number that we would always plug in to L. Well, they know that if we use the half of a decimeter, then we're going to get half of the readout that we should 
typically get. Uh, and there's many other laboratories like that that use different lengths of polar ember cells. So no big deal. We use the specific rotation. We plug in our length of our tube that we've used. And this allows us to get closer to the specific rotation, which is the standard measurement that everyone goes by. So that's a way that we fix the tube length. Uh, C. C is the concentration of the sample. And we know, just like before, that if you change the concentration of the sample, you could have more molecule, which will rotate light more, or less molecule, which will rotate the light less, right? So the concentration of the sample is typically pretty standard. Uh, it's basically gram per milliliter. That is what we use for that specific uh, rotation equation. Uh, so figure out how many grams of sugar that you've weighed out look at how many milliliters that you dissolve that in and that's the number that goes in for C. Specific rotation is basically written so that it's one gram of compound per milliliter and that's the number that we're provided in the reference textbooks but a lot of times we do not put one gram per milliliter in the sample can chamber so that's why we do our own calculation and figure out how many grams per milliliter we're actually using. All right, so for instance, if we measured out five grams of sugar and we put that into 50 mils of a volumetric flask, I would take five grams, divide it by 50. And this is the number that would be plugged into my concentration number for C, all right? So an example problem here would be, well, what if my observed rotation was negative 3.41? All right, well, no big deal. So negative 3.41 divided by the length of the cell that we've used in our laboratory is 0.5. So that's what I would put there. And then let's say that the C value, let's say that when I take the number of grams that I've weighed out and divided it by the number of milliliters that I've dissolved it in, came out to be 0 0.20. All right, so I'm going to bring up my calculator and I'll let you uh, watch me walk through. Make sure that you clean up the bottom first. So 0.5 times 0.2 and that's going to give me a 0.1 number. All right, so then I'm going to take 3.41 negative divided by 0.1, which is what was on the bottom, and I hit enter, and I get negative 34.1. So negative 34.1 is my specific rotation that would hopefully match up to a reference book or a textbook at some point somewhere. All right. So that is how we solve this equation. It's not too difficult. You'll have all of the pieces that you need. And this is the way that the lab is written. You know the observed rotation. You know the length of the cell. And you know the concentration because you made it. So you'll take the actual number of grams that you've weighed out, divide it by the milliliters that you dissolved it in, and that number is what goes into that equation. And you're solving for specific rotation every single time. All right, now what do we do with these numbers? All right, so for the first part, what you will have to do is make a graph. And when you make the graph, time is going to be on the bottom because that's your independent variable. So time at zero, which is the initial, and then time at 24 hours later. Now the issue is that you're going to be doing a lot of your measurements in minutes. So my advice to you is to go through and make the axis in minutes. And then this 24 hour, change that to minutes so everything is the same unit and that will be a pretty large number right there's 60 minutes in an hour so 24 times 60 and that's going to give you the final number that you'll put at the very end because that's where your final reading is going to be all right well maybe just maybe this sugar that i've ran will give me an optical rotation so the optical rotation is going to be here on the y-axis but the issue here is that it's not really the optical but it's the specific so you're going to be measuring your optical rotation throughout the time and you need to convert that over to specific rotation for every time interval 
So that means you'll get a observed rotation at 15 minutes. And then you need to convert that to specific rotation. And that's what you'll plot here on the y-axis, specific rotation every single time. Okay? Then you'll maybe do another reading at 30. Well, you'll convert that optical rotation of 30 minutes to specific rotation at 30 minutes, and this is what you will plot on your y-axis. You do the same thing for one hour. You'll do an observed rotation for one hour, convert that to specific rotation at that time using that equation, plot that onto the graph. And maybe what you'll find out is a curve. It's not going to be linear, but you'll find something of a curvy line that shows up. But sooner or later, this thing's going to flatline out. And it's not really going to give you that much change anymore as you begin to read the specific rotations. Uh, so when you do that, this is kind of the time that it took for that sugar to kind of settle out and come to equilibrium. So equilibrium is going to be basically where the flat line is on your graph. Some of those could happen within 15 minutes. Some of those might happen within an hour. Some of those might not even happen after 24 hours. Uh, so that's up to you to figure out and to report on. Okay, so those are the graphs that you'll need, and you'll need each. You'll need a graph for each sugar that you're analyzing. So four or five different graphs. They all should be very similar, but keep in mind they are not going to be linear. These kinetics, they're not linear. So do not add a regression line. You don't need it. Okay, we're not doing calibration work. These things should not have a linear relationship with each other. So you do not put a linear regression line on these graphs. Got it? Okay. So that's the first part of the lab. The first part of the lab is to make a set of sugars, run them at different time intervals, get observed rotations, convert the observed rotations to specific rotations, make a graph, time on the x-axis, specific rotation on the y-axis, and then allow this graph to produce a line and see where it flatlines, see where it comes to equilibrium, because those are the types of questions that you will have to answer in the laboratory itself. Okay? So in the next video, we'll come back and we'll talk about part B of the experiment and how part B is similar but different.